नमस्कार वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग गुड आफ्टरनून और गुड इवनिंग डिपेंडिंग अपॉन विच पार्ट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड यू आर आप सभी का पी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है आप सभी को नव वर्ष की बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं विशिंग यू ऑल ए वेरी हैप्पी हेल्दी एंड सेफ ईयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू एंड ए वेरी हार्टी वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान This is the 23rd uh, Vyakhyan of the 75 episode series of Vyakhyans, which is being organized as a part of PRL's Platinum Jubilee celebration. PRL completing 75 years of its uh, legacy and history in fundamental science and space research. Established in the year 1947. by the father of indian space program uh dr vikram sarabhai the prl platinum jubilee coincides with uh, india's uh, 75 years of independence so it's a joint celebration of development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhyan today we have another distinguished speaker professor sung kong of university of hong kong and uh, he will be delivering the vyakhyan on the topic organic matters in the universe with this i will request uh, my colleague uh, sam uh, to introduce the speaker over to you samal am i audible yes uh, thank you sir uh, hello everyone it is indeed a great great pleasure and honor for me to introduce you professor sun quark professor quark is a professional astronomer and author specializing in astrochemistry and stellar evolution he is best known for his theory on the origin of planetary nebulae and the, the death of sun like stars His current research is on the topic of the synthesis of complex organic compounds in the late stage of stellar evolution. So he uh, currently he is in uh, University of British Columbia, but before joining to the University of British Columbia in 2018, he served as Dean of Science and Chair Professor of Space Science at the University of Hong Kong. Prior to the University of Hong Kong, he served as the Director of the institute of astronomy and astrophysics academic sinica he was a kilam fellow professor of the canadian council and he was also professor of astronomy at the university of calgary canada professor quark has published more than 400 articles on diverse topics in addition he has written number of books including the origin of planetary nebula in uh, uh, 2000 cosmic butterflies in 2001 physics and chemistry of the interstellar medium in uh, 2007 organic matter in the universe in 2012 and star star dust the cosmic seed of life in 2013 recently he has written two books titled on our place in the universe one in 2017 and the latest one is in 2021 this shows and reflects his vast knowledge in the field of astrophysics in particular astrochemistry and astrobiology and uh, he has also uh, extensively served in the international organization for example he was the president of astrobiology commission of the international astronomical union he was president of international astronomical union interstellar matter commission and also the chairman of international astronomical union planetary nebula working group so with this short introduction now i invite professor quark to deliver today's vyakhyan or colloquium talking about organic matter in the universe over to you professor quark yeah thank you very much and uh i uh in particular want to thank everyone that uh, for your invitation because i have been to india five times and i hope i will be able to go there again Now I am unable to see myself, 
Is that a way I can see myself? Because I can only see my slide. Let me. You see the. You see a problem. But we are all able to see you. Uh, I uh, somehow I uh, I lost the image of um, the. Uh, let's see. Uh, please, uh, you, you have not shared your slides yet, so. Yeah, once I you put... should be able to see you, so you see yourself. Oh, I have not shared my slides. Oh, okay, maybe that's the problem. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Sure. Ah. ah, okay, thank you very much. I mean, uh, again, I was just saying that I have always enjoyed going to India, and I hope I have the chance to uh, go there again. Now, today I want to talk to you about the uh, topic of organic matter in the universe. Now, from the point of view of chemistry, uh, just a couple hundred years ago, a chemist uh, divided the, the uh, constituents of uh, the world into uh, living and non-living things. So they believe organic matter are the substances that are responsible for life. So what distinguishes life and non-life is something called vitality or the vital force. So they uh, base this belief because a lot of these, for example, chemicals that were derived from uh, uh, can only be derived from living things like a middle exit and, uh, and so on now or, or yeast and uh, but in the 19th century the, the laboratory uh, chemistry has been able to synthesize organic compounds from inorganic substances so starting with urea in 1823 and then all kinds of uh, other um, uh, uh, organic matter uh, can be synthesized through inorganic means. So this put an end to the theory of vitality. So today we no longer consider the organic matter as uh, single-handedly tied to life, except we now today define organic matter as a group of molecules which are based on the common elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, and so on. Now, if you look at organic matter on Earth, it is surprising that the most of the organic matter on Earth are not in the form of biomass or living things. In fact, most of the organic matter on Earth are in the form of kerogen. Now, these uh, kerogen are found in the centimeter rocks and they are remnants of past life. So when we have uh, dead trees or plants or animals, they uh, through under the pressure and temperature, uh, they uh, form something for, called kerogen, which is the precursor of uh, fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas. So it is important to Note that most of the uh, organic matter uh, on Earth are biologically related. They were remnants of past life. Now, if you look at kerogen, uh, the chemical structure is something like this. The dark sh shaded parts are islands of uh, aromatic rings, and they are linked by uh, chains of different uh, lengths and orientations, uh, which are uh, uh, of uh, random directions and so on. So in the past, uh, actually not that long ago, uh, scientists used to think that Earth is the only place that have organics. Now there has been some conjectures, for example, by Fred Hoyle and uh, Rick Machine that they speculated they could be complex organic uh, in the universe, but uh, very few people believe them. Now, 
in short 30 years or so, 30, 40 years, the picture has completely changed. Now today, we have evidence that organic compounds are very common throughout the universe, uh, ranging from our backyard, the solar system, all the way to the Milky Way galaxy, to external galaxies. So the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the change is really uh, quite, quite dramatic. And today I'm going to emphasize or concentrate on where do all these organics uh, come from. Okay, now actually the first step of this uh, change in the paradigm began in the 1950s. Now, the Swarovski and Charlie Tans uh, proposed that it may be possible to look for molecules in space. Now, at that time, no one, no astronomers believed them because people thought that in order to make a molecule, you have to have certain density so that they can collide and uh, have chemical reactions. And the density in the insular medium is too small to be, uh, to be uh, of, uh, to make molecules. And if they were made, then the uh, interstellar medium has a lot of ultraviolet light background, and these ultraviolet light are supposed to be able to destroy all any molecules. Now, of course, now with millimeter wave uh, uh, instruments and so on, we now have detected over 200 uh, molecules in the interstellar medium. So this, uh, uh, so this, uh, uh, ideas of Slavsky and Tans actually uh, turn out to be correct. Now, how do we detect molecules? They are, we can either detect them by their rotational motion, which are primarily occurring in the uh, millimeter wave uh, part of the spectrum, or they can, you can detect them by their shedging or bending modes, and these uh, would mostly occur in the infrared wavelengths. Through, because through our uh, infrared and millimeter wave techniques, we can now detect uh, uh, molecules. Now this uh, shows a uh, spectrum, just an example, to show you how common uh, molecules are. It's very interesting, in this uh, spectrum, there's no single piece of noise. Every feature that you see in this spectrum is a emission from a molecule. So there are so many molecules <laughs> Uh, in, in the in the cell medium, they basically fill up the uh, millimeter wave uh, spectrum. Now, what kind of molecules? Now we have actually every kind of organics are represented, ranging from hydrocarbons to alcohol, acid, aldides, and uh, since biological molecules, we need nitrogen. So nitrogen is found in, for example, cyanopolyions, uh, in almines, and uh, we also have uh, oxygen incorporated. So we have ethers and, uh, uh, and uh, various oxygen uh, uh, compounds are mixed with hydrogen and carbon. Now, uh, how, how can we be sure? Now, because the laboratory spectroscopy uh, is so good that we can determine the uh, frequency of the rotation transitions of molecules to the accuracy of one in 10 million. So when we detect a molecule, so let's say over several spectral lines or several rotational transitions, so our certainty is actually very high. So we know quite certain that we are detecting a specific molecule. So all kinds of uh, biologically related molecule have been uh, detected. For example, carboaldehyde, the first step to mix sugar was detected. Now, now, however, there are still lots of biological molecules not detected. For example, no amino acid uh, has been detected in spite of a lot of searches. Uh, so now the, the, the question is not really that uh, we think it's not really because they are not there, but because when you a molecule gets larger, it has more rotational states and we have a very large partition function of the molecule, so the molecule is diluted uh, over many different transitions. So it's uh, making each transition uh, much weaker. So, so yes, another problem is uh, line confusion. Like I showed in the previous uh, spectrum, there are so many lines uh, from common molecules, for example, methanol, and a lot of lines. So these common molecules kind of swarm out 
any weak signals uh, from a large molecule. Now, so other than astronomical technique by uh, remote uh, spectroscopic observations, either in the millipede wave or in the infrared, now we can also perform experiments. Now we can, we have the capability to look at solar system objects. I mean, the simplest thing is uh, to pick up a meteorite from the ground, which you can put in the lab for analysis. You can fly up an airplane to collect interstellar dust particles from the upper atmosphere. And we also now have the capability to fly, to fly uh, uh, space missions to asteroids, cam comets, uh, planetary satellites, and either to perform the analysis there or even bringing back the sample to Earth for uh, laboratory analysis. Now, once you have the materials in the laboratory, there are all kinds of techniques you can use to the, for we, we, are, we are able to analyze the content of the uh, of this substance in detail. So, organics. Now, first, beginning with meteorites, uh, because the, we can pick up a meteorite from the ground, you can put it in the lab for analysis. Now, there are tens of thousands of organic compounds found in meteorites. And we know these organic compounds are not results of life because their abundance decreases with increasing carbon number. So they are not breakdown products of life, but they were synthesized abiologically, probably from smaller compounds to larger compounds. So, so our view of the solar system have also changed. Because in the past, let's say 50 years ago, uh, astronomers used to think the uh, uh, solar system objects are made of minerals, metals, and ices. Now we have organic compounds, uh, both molecules and solids, everywhere in planetary satellites, or in planets, in asteroids, in comets, in meteorites, in outer minor bodies in the, in the outer solar system. So the key question is, where do they come from? Were they made in the solar nebula after the formation of the solar system, or they were carried from somewhere else? So this is the question that I want to address today. Now, so planetary scientists, of course, in the past, uh, mostly think that the, uh, the organics were made uh, within the solar system, but uh, now more and more people are not so certain because as I, as I would describe today in this talk, we now have direct evidence that complex organics are being made by old stars, stars at the end, near the end of the stellar evolution. So I will go to, into this discussion of this topic in detail. Now let's put things into context. So, when a star gets old, uh, for example, the sun will move out from the main sequence, become a red giant, and after the connection of helium into carbon, that go up onto the symptotic giant branch, uh, on the symptotic branch, and branch, the star will begin to, to lose mass in the form of a stellar wind. So, after this, uh, the, uh, the complete envelope of the star is lost by the stellar wind process, the, uh, the core of the star would become uh, hotter and evolve to the uh, to the hot, the uh, high temperature side of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram and uh, going through the stage of planetary nebulae. So, now this mass loss process uh, uh, is extremely interesting. So, now we know that in the late stage of evolution, a star can eject so much material that it they, the stellar wind can completely uh, shield the star from a direct observation. So this is an example of uh, actual uh, spectrum observed by the uh, infrared spectrum, uh, uh, infrared space observatory. This is the photosphere of the star. Actually, the entire output of the star is converted into infrared light by the absorption of circumstellar material. So this is the actual observed spectrum, which reflects the complete conversion of optical light 
into uh, infrared light. So these uh, uh, infrared objects are uh, now we now call extreme carbon stars. They are uh, extreme. They are they are at the very end of the uh, uh, stellar evolution. Now by looking at uh, stellar winds of uh, asymptotic giant branch stars by using, for example, meter meter wave telescopes, we can now detect the uh, uh, rotational or vibrational transitions of over 80 molecules. They in include simple inorganics to organics like methane, acetylene, or uh, chains, those are you know, polyion, the C3N, the G5N, uh, even rings and like C3H2. So these molecules were made in the stellar wind of the star under extremely low density uh, conditions. So now because the stellar wind has a very limited lifetime because of the, uh, the, uh, the velocity of the wind, we know that what we are looking at the envelope, we are looking at an envelope no more than say 10,000 years old. So within this uh, 10,000 years, the stars are able to make all kinds of molecules. Now, not only are they able to make molecules, they also can make minerals. So, from, we now have surveyed thousands of stars that show the uh, uh, emission spectrum of amorphous silicates, which is a common sand like uh, a mineral, and uh, they are very common. Almost every oxygen rich uh, red giant star will show evidence for uh, silicate minerals. Now for the carbon rich ones, they show the signature of silicon carbide. So now what happened next? So after the asymptotic giant branch, the stars will evolve to become hotter. The central star, the central, the core of the star will become later become a white dwarf. And the outer envelope will be seen in the form as the predatory nebula. Now I'm not going to go into details about what, how, how do penetrating nebulae come about, except to note that they are very short-lived phenomenon. Penetrating nebulae probably last only 20, 30,000 years. So over this short period of time, they represent the very large stage of uh, stellar evolution. Now the most surprising uh, discovery of uh, infrared astronomy uh, came in the 1970s. So a group of uh, graduate students from the University of Minnesota, University of California, San Diego, they observed uh, some planetary nebulae, in this particular case, the uh, NCC 727, and they saw a whole family of very strong infrared features, which no one had seen before. So those features occurred at 3.3, 6.2, 7.7, 8.6, .7, 8 and 11.3 microns. So these features are very strong, but they are not atomic lines because atomic lines, we know where they are. So for example, these uh, purple line, narrow lines, are atomic lines, so these are called unidentified infrared emission bands because at that time, no one knew what they, what they were. Now, the first identification was done by Roger Neck and, and uh, Walter Dewey. They both published papers in Nature saying that the 3.3 micron feature is due to the CX stretching mode of aromatic compounds. Now, <laughs> no one believed them. So for, for, for over 30 years, they hardly got any citations because people at that time thought it's impossible for a uh, for star or in the stellar medium to have organic compounds. Now, except with more and more observations, we now know that these uh, UIE bands are everywhere. They are seen in the diffuse in the stellar medium, they are seen in H2 regions, they are seen uh, also in external galaxies. So they are very common uh, emissions uh, in the universe. Now, this is the spectrum of M82. Now, you can see the UIE bands are extremely prominent. They uh, represent a uh, significant fraction of the total energy uh, emitted by the galaxy. So, with the Spitzer telescopes, uh, more and more uh, uh, galaxies were observed, and the, the 
UIE bands are detected, they are found to be very common. So, so this is the uh, uh, 11.3 uh, micron feature. They can be seen as far as redshift of two, which means that 10 billion years ago, the universe is was already uh, filled with organics. And uh, not only that, they, uh, the amount of energy coming out from these UIE bands can be as high as 20% of the total luminosity of the galaxy. So it means that not only they were present, they are present in very large quantities. So now, now they are seen in so many objects, so how are they synthesized? Now the, the best way to look at them is look at planetary nebulae. Because when you look at a galaxy or a true region, you don't know they have been there for millions or billions of years, so you don't know when they were made. But in the planetary nebula, it's a very short-lived phenomenon. They only last 20, 30,000 years. So we know when we detect the UIE bands there, so we must know the chemical carriers were made within that short period of time. So the, these are the key questions. So the UIE bands are seen in planetary nebulae, but they are not seen in the progenitor asymptotic giant branch stars. Now they are, planetary nebulae have a lifetime of only a couple of tens of thousands of years. So they, um, they have to be made within that short period of time. So in order to study the origin or the carriers of these UIE bands, it would be useful to identify the transition objects between planet AGB stars and planetary nebulae. But in the early 1990s, none of those objects were known. So I was very keen to uh, search for the missing link between uh, symptotic giant branch stars and planetary nebulae. They are very difficult to find because these, uh, what we call protoplanetary nebulae, have no emission lines. So they are they just look like an ordinary star, so it is uh, not as easy as to identify as a planetary nebulae. So uh, without going into any details, uh, Bruce Ricknack and I were able to discover about 30 uh, protoplanetary nebulae uh, in the early 1990s uh, based on follow-up observations of IRS sources. So these are some examples of the objects that, that we discovered. Uh, these are objects uh, that were pictures taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, but you can see that although they look like planetary nebula, they are actually do not have any emission lines. So they, they, every, the brightness that you see are strictly due to refracted starlight. Now, so once we discover these objects, we do follow up observations. So first we do optical spectroscopy, we do infrared spectroscopy. So the one that really out is that they show the 3.3, micro emission feature, which now we believe to be due to the CH stretching mode of an aromatic compound, but they also show an unknown feature as 3.4 micron. Now, by comparing with the literature of laboratory chemistry, uh, this is identified as the symmetric or anti-symmetric stretching mode of uh, Adiphatic, uh, adiphatic compounds. So, for, for example, methyl groups or methylene groups uh, that uh, uh, would have CH stretching modes at 3.4 micron. So, this is a spectrum of a young planetary nebula uh, taken with the Keck telescope. So, this is the 3.3 micron feature, which we now know to be due to uh, CH or aromatic compounds. But these are due to uh, adiphatic compounds. So, so I mean, this is just a, a, a schematic. So, aromatics are uh, ring-like structures. For example, if you have a number of rings here, that uh, the uh, and if they have a corner, they have uh, attached to a hydrogen, then you sh can show up the uh, 3.3 micron feature. But if they have a methyl group or methylene group on the uh, on the side, then they will show up the uh, and 3.4 micron feature. So the second thing we discover was that in addition to the UIE bands, they also show very broad plateau-like features around eight and 12 microns uh, in protoplanetary nebulae. 
So this is the observed profile. And uh, we suggest that these are due to superpositions of aliphatic side groups because many aliphatic side groups that would have imprint bending mode, imprint bending modes are, are bending like this around 8 micron, and they have our plane bending modes uh, around 12 micron. So if you have a whole bunch of junk uh, attached to the aromatic rings, then these aliphatic substances would all vibrate at slightly different frequencies, and therefore they would superimpose themselves to form a broad plateau of feature. So we can hypothesize what are the uh, pathway of uh, synthesis. So we know that in the asymptotic giant branch, we have hydrocarbons like CH4, uh, methane and uh, butane and so on. And uh, in the very old asymptotic giant branch stars, we see the first signature of a satellite which occurs at 13.7 micron. Now, acetylene is a linear molecule, and this is supposed to be the first building block of benzene. Now, benzene is also detected in the uh, Apollo Planetary Nebula, so this is a vibrational mode when all six hydrogen are bending uh, uh, relative to the plane, and, um, and the uh, the benzene, the C6H6, has been detected. In the, uh, this protoplanetary nebula, we can also see diacetylene, triacetylene. So one can imagine that a scenario that uh, during the late stages of uh, the asymptotic giant branch, we first formed the leading molecule acetylene, then three acetylene molecules would band together to form the first ring molecule benzene. Now, during the polyoplanetary nebula phase, which lasts about three to 6,000 years, these uh, rings would cluster together to form groups of aromatic rings with some uh, uh, aliphatic uh, groups attached to the rings. And uh, when they evo evolve to planetary nebula stage, maybe more of these rings would group together to form larger units of uh, aromatics. Now, this uh, loss of advantage of uh, studying uh, circumstellar chemistry because the system is simple. We, we have a single energy source. There's only a single star in the middle. We have a single simple geometry, sometimes spherical symmetry. And we also have so, independent means to detect the, determine the temperature density and the background radiation and so on. Now, most importantly, we know the time scale. So from the, uh, uh, the wind of the AGB star, they, they have a dynamical age of about 10,000 years. In planetary nebula, the evolutionary time scale is about a few thousand years. In planetary nebula, the lifetime is about 10,000 years. So let's uh, go back to summarize the uh, UIE phenomenon. So we have five major features, uh, 3.3, 6.2, 8.7, 8.6, 7 .3. We now know that we also have aliphatic features at 3.4 and 6.9. There are some weaker features at 15.8, 17.4, etc. And they have also plateau features. These are broad features of uh, two, three microns wide, centered around 8, 12, and 17 microns. So the scientific question is, what is the chemical structure of the carrier? Now, for the past 30 years, the most uh, popular hypothesis in the astronomy community is that the UIE bands are due to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon or pH molecules. So what are pH molecules? These are simple ring molecules arranged uh, in a plane. They are made up of 22 elements, carbon and hydrogen. And uh, so this hypothesis is so popular that thousands of papers are written have been appeared in the literature. So as stated by uh, Fielens, that uh, they believe that the UIE feature is the result of infrared fluorescence of small, less than 50 carbon atom, gas phase gas, pH molecules, which are pumped 
by far ultraviolet photons. So when the photon hit a pH molecule, it is excited to a high electronic state. When they cascade, they will go through the vibrational transitions and emit these uh, infrared bands that we see in the form of the UIE bands. Now, the strongest argument in support of the pH hypothesis is due to Selwyn, who suggested that because we see the UIE bands in the diffuse in the stellar medium, where the temperature is very low, in order to excite them, you cannot excite them thermally. So one of the ways is by single photon excitation. So a single ultraviolet photon would come in to hit a small molecule, which can excite it to thousands of degrees uh, for a very short period of time. So that is the, this, uh, is the, the what makes the pH hypothesis uh, so popular. Now, however, there are lots of problems with this hypothesis. Now, pH molecules are very simple. They're well studied by chemists, and they, being a molecule, they have very narrow uh, lines, but the observed UIE bands are broad. pH molecules are primarily excited by UV photons with very little absorption cross-section in the visible, but the UIE bands are seen in places where there are no UV background, for example, in progranular nebulae, in refraction nebulae. Now, most interestingly, the pH molecules have very strong electronic transitions in the ultraviolet. So it would be very easy to see the electronic bands in absorption if to, when you look to a, a background source uh, and if the pH molecules are throughout the in the stellar medium, it would be very easy to detect. But so far, upper limits can only uh, be observed. So this upper limit is about three order of magnitude higher uh, or lower than expected from the pH hypothesis. That is to say that if you want to emit a strong infrared feature, you need a thousand times <laughs> the uh, the molecules that you see uh, uh, in the ultraviolet. So there is an incompatibility between the uh, ultraviolet and infrared observations. So now the chemists are very unhappy because the chemists know the uh, pH molecules very well because they have been studying them in the laboratory. So basically, for example, as quoted here from the uh, Berkeley group by Secondly, uh, that uh, the no pH uh, emission spectrum has been able to uh, correlate with the laboratory spectrum. Now, the uh, the uh, from observations, the uh, the shape and the peak wavelength of the UIE bands are independent of the exciting temperature, the exciting star. So that means that is really not dependent on how, how much ultraviolet uh, they, uh, is in the background. Now, now how about feeding of the observations? Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, the literature and you see, for example, paper by Thelens, he will show a beautiful feed of the, uh, of the uh, uh, astronomical UIE bands with pH uh, molecules. Now, how, how did they do that? They first have to use a large variety of pH molecules of different sizes, structures, ionization state, and they have so, of course, artificially introduced the, uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 intrinsic profile. Now, let's go back to the uh, original idea. When first Roger Neck suggests that the 3.3 uh, the micron is due to uh, aromatic rings, because a lot of our, our aromatic molecules, including pH molecules, have CH charging modes around 3.3 micron. They also, many of them, have our plane bending modes, CH bending modes, around 11.3 micron. So that seems a very good coincidence. Now, however, the, pH, the, the UIE bands also have strong bands at 6.2, 7.7, and 8.6. Micron. So these bands, the pH molecules, cannot explain. Okay. So I am in here. I have a quote from a paper by 
the case so it's, uh, it's uh, really uh, the campus are not very very unhappy so now how do we reconcile so over the past 30 years uh, people try to uh, add things to the pH uh, hypothesis saying that we have different ionization state we make the molecule larger to several hundred or even thousand carbon atoms and uh, so that they will increase the, uh, the absorption in the visible. And uh, we have to take away some hydrogen, add some hydrogen, introduce some side groups, and uh, introduce some other elements of nitrogen and oxygen into the pH molecules in order to produce, for example, the 6.2 micron band. So all these modifications had moved so far from the chemical definition of pH that it's no longer proper to refer this hypothesis as the pH hypothesis. So now, uh, coming back to the feeling. So in NASA Ames, they have a very extensive database, both of experimental and theoretical uh, spectral uh, behavior of pH molecules. They have hundreds of pH molecules and uh, with different sizes and different uh, a charge state, both negative and positively charged. So they use the mixture of these molecules and they have a routine to fit the astronomical spectra. So they are very kind to give us the access to both the database as well as, well as the, the feeding routine. So we try to run the feeding routines to try to fit other things. So so we're able to use the database and routines to fit, for example, the silicate emission feature, which is an inorganic substance. We are able to fit the spectrum of coal, which is a terrestrial organic. We are able to fit the spectrum of hydrogenated amorphous carbon, which is a hydrocarbon, which is not of a regular structure. And we can create some very peculiar hydrocarbons, uh, which are nowhere look like a uh, pH molecule, and we can still fit the spectrum of that. Actually, we can create artificial spectrum with five features or 10 features, and we can still use the pH model to fit them. So, you know, in other words, the pH model can fit anything. So the fact that they can fit the astronomical uh, UIE bands are totally meaningless. So, Coming back to the question, if it's not pH molecules as the carrier, then what is it? Now, actually, you just mix two elements, carbon and carbon, you can make very complex organic out of it. So this is pure, pure uh, uh, aromatic graphite. This is pure aliphatic, which is diamond. It's a pure carbon. So if you add hydrogen to, you make a triangle, so in the bottom of the triangle, you have a planar molecule, which are pH molecules, which are ring completely aromatic molecules in a plane. But actually, anything inside of this triangle is possible, so long you mixed aromatic with aliphatic structures. So all kinds of amorphous alloys can be made with just two elements by mixing them into different bonds. Okay, so experimentally, you can do similar things. So you, all you have to do is put some hydrocarbons like methane or whatever, and you bombard them with energy, either with microwave, laser, or heat, and you let them sit for a while, you collect the uh, uh, evaporated uh, material and let them condense into the substrate, and you analyze the substrate. So this is one of the spectrum of these uh, co compounds. So you can see that they are they show some resemblance to the astronomical uh, UIE band. So this is from a planetary nebula. This is a spectrum of planetary nebula. So this is another uh, of these uh, carbonaceous compounds uh, artificially created in the lab. And again, this is from the Sake group in France, so you can see that they also show, show some resemblance. So there is suggestive evidence 
that the UIE bands are due to some kind of carbonaceous uh, amorphous structure. So let's come back to the uh, to the observed properties of the UIE bands. So what is the chemical structure of the carrier if they are not pH molecules? So my suggestion is that they could arise from mixed aromatic aliphatic organic nanoparticles, moons uh, for short. So these are small units of aromatic rings that are linked by aliphatic chains of random orientations and length. They also have impurities because our world is not pure. We can have oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, and they are mixed together uh, in this uh, kind of uh, complex forms. So they are amorphous. They are not fixed regular structure like pH. They can contain rings of different sizes and, and chains of different lengths. They have impurities. They are three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So and they, the ex exact composition can be determined on the C, C to H ratio and the ratio of aliphatic to aromatic compound and so on. So we can create theoretical structures of this kind uh, and, then, and then study them. So for example, this is a moon molecule based on 169 carbon atoms. Okay, so this is something that we just do in, on a computer. So now I don't have time to go into the details, but we can try to understand the vibrational properties of these uh, organic compounds first by studying uh, the properties of pH molecules, and then we add some side groups to it so that we know that we know what's going on, and then we try to add more rings or chains and see how the uh, spectral behavior changes. And again, I'm not uh, going to do, go into the details, but the thing to emphasize is that there are fundamental differences between pH and moons. Okay, so pH molecule believed to be free flying molecules. And in terms of monks, they are large number of carbon atoms that may be in the form of solids. So they are the, the pH molecules have regular structures. Uh, moons have these amorphous and with variable sizes and so on. They are not pure aromatic, they are mixed aromatic and aliphatic. Moons are three dimensional pH molecules are two-dimensional. pH molecule, the pH hypothesis, requires them to be small with less than 50 carbon atoms. In moons, we can be talking about hundreds or even thousands of carbon atoms. So the pH hypothesis say that they are pure carbon hydrogen. In moons, we allow for the presence of oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and other things. So the pH molecules are pure rings, and the moons have other kind of functional groups uh, in addition to rings. Now I want to also bring into the picture of fullerene, which is now have been found in planetary nebulae and many other places. Why I want to bring in fullerene is that for all the fullerene carrying planetary nebulae, they all show the plateau features. So this is the 8 micron plateau, this is the 12 micron plateaus. Now as I mentioned before, the plateau features are common properties or part of the UIE phenomenon. So there must be some relationship between fullerene and the UIE carrier. So there are a couple papers suggesting maybe fullerenes uh, are the descendants of uh, moons. Okay. So, so, so this, uh, whether we first have moons and then we have uh, fullerenes later. Now, there's another key uh, interesting observations. Now, when Hoyle suggested there are lots of organics in, uh, in, uh, in space, that uh, uh, Beckermishing and Allen, using the Australian uh, UK and uh, uh, Australian telescope, tried to follow uh, Hoyle's uh, prediction and try to look along the line of sight to some infrared bright sources, in that particular case to the galactic center, and they detect a very strong feature 
at 3.4 micron. Now, as we mentioned before, the 3.4 micron feature is due to the CX stretch of aliphatic compounds. So now, many other lines of sight can be detected, and we have evidence for aliphatic compounds everywhere in the diffuse interstellar medium. So this is the 3.4 micron band. We can also see the, uh, their counterpart, the bending modes at 6.9 micron. Now, so it's estimated now because the interpretation of absorption feature is very easy. It's very easy to interpret the strength of the uh, absorption feature, which is directly proportional to the column density. So we know that if you see such a strong feature, that means at least 15% of the carbon in the diffuse interstellar medium has to be in the form of aliphatics. Now, they're not only in the diffuse SM, they are also in galaxies. So this in the halo of M82, the Curry uh, telescope detected the 3.4 micron features throughout the halo of M82. So that means there are aliphatics in the uh, outskirts of galaxies. So now on one side, we have astronomers who are now finding evidence of these uh, uh, organics. On the other hand, there are space planetary scientists who are studying solar system objects, and they are, as I will mention in a minute, also seeing organics. Now, could there be any relation between the two? Now, because planetary nebulae are planetary, a stage that goes goes through by 95% of the stars. So these things are very common. So these organics are being ejected by planetary nebulae. They could spread all over the galaxy and they could end up in the primordial solar nebula. So in the solar system, we now have the capability to look at comets, asteroids, planetary satellites, and uh, not only we can do remote observations, we can do in situ analysis, so we can also do uh, uh, sample return. So. At the beginning, we can do some remote observations. We can see that there are uh, uh, organic molecules uh, in, the, in the infrared, for example, by looking at Jupiter or Saturn. Uh, we can do it, we can use the, uh, other spectroscopic uh, uh, observations to uh, look at uh, uh, planetary satellites, and we have we can look at meteoroids, that which is the, the most the strongest evidence because starting in the 1960s, we had find uh, complex organics in, in meteoroids. At first, people thought, oh, these are contamination of uh, uh, by terrestrial organics, but no, there are now so much, so much organics that tens of thousands of organic compounds, actually practically every family of organic compounds have been found in meteorites. And not only that, they, they, they're definitely not terrestrial because on, the, on Earth, we have only, in life, we have only 20 amino acids. In, the, in meteorites, there are over 100 amino acids detected. So they are, they are we have, uh, we have uh, uh, in, in terrestrial life, we have five uh, nuclear bases. Now, they are, in meteorites, there are more nuclear bases than the five. In the, in the amino axis on Earth, everything, every amino axis is left-handed. In meteorites, they are both right and hand, left-handed. So, so these things are completely unrelated to terrestrial life. So these things are completely built up abiologically. Okay? So, so that means organic chemistry is not restricted to ter terrestrial biochemistry because the universe is a able to make other kinds of organics quite easily and successfully uh, by totally abiological means. Now, more, that's also very interesting in the in, in, in meteorites and, uh, and there are something called insol insoluble organic matter, which consists of 70% of the uh, organic matter and uh, you can analyze them. They have a structure of mixed aromatic and aliphatic structure. And if you look at the chemical formula, they have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and so on. You, you, uh, you can take a spectrum 
you can see that uh, uh, they have uh, they have uh, uh, bands which are similar to what we see in uh, in the astronomical observations. Now, of course, comets. We now know that there are lots of molecules in comet, but most importantly, by Rosetta, for example, fly into the comet itself. You can see that the uh, the 3.4 micron feature uh, here, which is very similar to the Proto-Planetary Nebula 3.4 micron feature. In the, so in comets, you can see uh, you can see uh, features which are similar to uh, what we have in astronomically in asteroids. Some, some asteroids are very red color, which seems to indicate they have a surface uh, covered with uh, complex organics. So so it's Ceres, one of the largest uh, asteroids. You can see the uh, the 3.4 micron feature are very prominent. So this is again so, so some similarity with astronomical features. You can collect interplanetary dust particles. You can again see the 3.4 micron features in interplanetary dust particles. So maybe there is a connection. Okay? So on the uh, on the planetary stuff like Titan, we now know that Titan is filled with organics. They are sand dunes which are organic in nature. They are lakes which are filled with organics. In fact, there's more hydrocarbons in on Titan than the total oil and gas reserve on Earth. Now, in the last in news, in the last couple of years, you have a lot of news about discovering of organic molecules on Mars, on Enceladus, and so on. They've been uh, announced as evidence for life, but they are nothing of that kind. These are just complex organics, naturally uh, built up abiologically and nothing to do with life. You look at uh, Pluto. Now the uh, the New Horizon spacecraft find that Pluto has uh, a complex color, which uh, seem to indicate that the surface of Pluto is covered with organics. Now, now I mentioned before. Well, maybe some of these stardust uh, could uh, come to the to the solar system. Actually, we already have evidence for it in the form of the uh, pre-solar grains. These are solar. These are minerals which are found in meteorites which have isotopic ratios uh, similar to those in asymptotic giant branch star. So these are minerals made by asymptotic giant branch star. They were ejected by the star, they travel across the galaxy, they end up in the solar system. So coming to the summary, I hope I uh, convey to you that organic compounds are everywhere in the universe, from the solar system to interstellar medium to galaxies. The, uh, the UIE bands are very common. They are even uh, there as early as 10 billion years ago. They, uh, they, uh, they are consistent with the uh, uh, moon being their, their chemical carrier. Now, the interesting thing I want to emphasize is that planetary nebulae and novae are the only objects we have direct evidence of ongoing synthesis of organics. So we, because of the time scale is so short, uh, in the case of Novi, it's even shorter that we can actually see these organics being made in these sort of, in these systems. So all it takes is uh, a few hundred or few thousand years for organics to be made. So there are uh, uh, pre-solar grains in the uh, uh, meteorites suggesting that uh, ejecta from star can travel across the uh, the, uh, the interstellar medium. There are macro molecular organics in meteorites in the in the planetary dust particles in comets, planetary satellites, and they have spectral similarities to the uh, organics that we see, uh, which are being produced by planetary nebulae. So the question is, to what extent the solar system was enriched by stellar ejectors? Even more. Interesting is that is it possible that the early Earth was chemically enriched by extraterrestrial, in this case, stellar organics? So I'm coming to the end of the talk. I leave here a number of references which uh, have the technical details of uh, some of the things I talk about in this talk. So I hope I convey to you the uh, 
the importance of organic matter in reverse, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kulak, for giving a broad overview on organic compounds and uh, its kind of implications to our or one origin. So now uh, uh, I will request my colleague, uh, Dr. Bhala, to moderate the question answer section. Dr. Bhala, please. Thank you, Manas. And thank you, Professor Hassan Kwak, for a wonderful talk. Of course, the MAONS has been our uh, major part of the proposals for the last one decade for the experimental yeah. Proposals that we have submitted to NSRRC and to Denmark, of course, for many proposals in India as well. Now we are open to questions from the participants. Those who are in Webex, you can unmute your mic and you can directly ask your questions to Professor Sankwak. May I, Professor Bala? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Kwok, for this wonderful and fascinating talk on highly interdisciplinary aspect and very thought-provoking and uh, very interesting uh, talk in terms of origin of life and how it has come from from the organics, and and it touches upon you know several aspects of uh, you know chemistry, physics, biology, astronomy, and it's really you know uh, had been a great into informative thought, talk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I have I have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is in terms of when you talked about the AGB uh, spectra, there yes. was a, you know uh, from one micron the whole spectra shifted to almost around 15 micron. It's a kind of something pushed it, not a change of tail or something on one direction. What is the mechanism that makes it to move in oh, total? Yes. Yeah. You know? Right. So so for uh, AGB stars. It has a temperature of about three thousand degrees, so so you uh, so the peak in the, in the infrared. So supposedly, uh, if there is nothing outside, we can see an optical, a visible star. Now, but if the star eject a lot of dust, which obscures the the photosphere, then the, the visible light are all absorbed by the circumstellar uh, solar particles, so they re radiate in the infrared which in this case, we only have a temperature of say 300 degrees. So the, the peak completely shifts. So this, uh, the spectrum I show is a very perfect example that the entire visible spectrum is completely shifted uh, to the infrared by dust self emission. Okay, thanks, wonderful. Another uh, point which I has, uh, you know, wondering is that, that is the whole now, you know, are there two different types of organic chemistry, one terrestrial and one non-terrestrial? Because especially in the right. cyclic <laughs> talk, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, you know, um, amino acids and all you showed, you know, all the, the, the meteoritic origin are all different types of uh, right. you know, differences you brought in. So, which are not present in terrestrial, uh, you know, systems. Yeah. So are yeah. there two yeah. different types of... Uh, they, they, can... I think the answer is that there can be many, many bio different systems of biochemistry on Earth. Somehow, through chance or circumstances, we tunneled into a single biochemistry, which is the, the biochemistry of living organisms. But in a different planet, or different kind of surroundings, <laughs> using similar ingredients, we could have completely different yeah. biochemistry. Now, as evidence that we only use 20 amino acids, but we know <laughs> from meteorites, we have over 100 amino acids. So if you use different kind of amino acids, you have a totally different biochemistry. A similar for nuclear acids, we use only five. and <laughs> that other biochemistry may use other five or six or whatever. So, so, so we have a very biased view of biology because we have only one example of biology. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I'll, I'll let our others you know, ask questions. There are a lot of interesting questions that are there on the YouTube I'm seeing. Yes, uh, Professor Bala. 
you may carry on. Thank you. Thank you. So, we are again open to questions for uh, participants through the WebEx. Please unmute your mic and you can directly ask to Professor your questions. In between, I have one question, Professor Kwa. Uh, yes. Can you please uh, tell us the advantage that we are going to have from the James Webb Space Telescope? Ah, okay. Well, this is a long story. <laughs> okay. Well, of course, we know that the uh, the, the James Webb Maxwell Telescope. But, sorry, sorry. The the JWST is a much larger telescope. It's going to be much more sensitive. It has a lot of capability in the in the infrared and so on. And uh, to put a very long story short, I would like to have seen more uh, spectroscopic capability in the longer wavelengths, which is uh, which is not present. So, 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 so we, I, I'm sure that the JWST will do a lot of very wonderful things, just being the fact that it's more uh, sensitive. But a lot of the questions that uh, we have, for example in terms of the vibrational modes of organics, uh, many of the modes are in longer wavelengths and, and not, so JWST may not be able to answer uh, all the questions. Okay. So, so some years ago, uh, Scott Sanford and I proposed a mission called the Astrobiology Explorer. Uh, it went into, uh, well, only a couple phases and then it was not, uh, not, not selected. So, so, so I, I, I think we, I mean, from our biased point of view, we would like to see more uh, spectroscopic capability <laughs> at longer wavelengths. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor Kwa, uh, read out a message from uh, our senior colleagues. You may be known if you have thought. Professor JPK Banerjee okay. has a message for you. He, is, uh, he was unable to attend the talk, so he has shared this message. Several people from PRL, Kailash Sahu, BG Anandar Rao, and Professor DPK Banerjee have worked on planetary nebulae, and we remember Professor Quark's landmark paper that changed the thinking of on how planetary nebulae formed. And they have cited your paper, Quark et al., Abjay Letters in 1978. That's the message from uh, Professor uh, DPK Banerjee. Okay, uh, with that, we'll move to the questions. Uh, from the YouTube chat box, we have a couple of questions. Of course, the Bala, if I can ask question, Bala, Bala, excuse me. Ah, yes, yes. If I can ask question. Yeah. Yes, please. So, yes. other than amino acids, uh, what do you require for the uh, existence of life? Uh, you are saying more than 100 amino acids have been found uh, in, but uh, what else do you require other than amino acids to prove that their life exists uh, like other than Earth? Well, we, we don't know. I mean, we have only one example of life. And uh, all I think the, uh, the uh, new discoveries are made uh, just uh, evidence that nature is uh, much smarter than us. I mean, nature can make a lot of different kinds of biologically relevant uh, molecules and uh, without uh, the help of life. So these things are built up abiologically. So, so just go back to the case of, say, planetary nebulae. I, I didn't mention in detail. Actually, we can produce a sequence of events. For example, we can go from acetylene to benzene, benzene to uh, rings and, and rings to uh, rings with adiphatics. And so so, so, so things are built up from the bottom. So we believe that in the case of solar system, it is also similar. So the uh, the, the, the the organics in in comets, in asteroids, in uh, in uh, uh, meteoroids, they are not breakdown of larger systems, but they were built up from smaller molecules. So somehow nature is very efficient in uh, building up uh, large mo molecules from smaller ones. And, and just as, a, as, as a result, just by playing with carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and sulfur and phosphorus, I mean, we can make all kinds of things. And that's why 
<laughs> we can we can have uh, ingredients of 400 amino acids. Although the effect, biologically, we don't know because we have not yet found another example of life. So uh, another question, you are talking of like nucleobases ATCG. So you are yes. finding other nucleobases like other than ATCG. That's right. Which That's kind right. of That's life right. form it will lead? Which kind of life form it will lead? Yeah, yeah. Area? So, so uh, you go back to the slide there, there's a, there's a paper by Collinghead. And, and they, they, you know, they are, they are other, what we chemically would define as a, a nuclear exit, but not uh, that the ones that we do to do, do use in our living systems. So, so what, what we mean by nuclear exit is that these are the bases which connect the DNA chains, right? I mean, you have, you have the phosphate based uh, uh, backbone, and you, you you need the nuclear bases to connect them, and there are many ways you can connect those uh, uh, backbones. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arpi. Uh, there are more uh, questions for the sex. Yeah, go ahead, anyone. Yeah, I'm Goro. Yeah. Goro, go ahead. Yeah. Professor, uh, could you please uh, uh, comment on the presence of fish line ISS in space or fish line things in space? I'm sorry. Presence of fish line ISS in space. Uh, could you uh, comment on that? Okay, I will. I will explain the questions. Uh, Mr. Gaurav is asking about the crystalline nature of molecular isos in the ISM clouds. Can you please comment on that? That's the question. Uh, I'm sorry, I still didn't quite catch the. Okay, so he's asking about the because you you talked about the amorphous nature of MAO. Right. right. Yes. Yes. So Gaurav is asking about the crystalline nature. Oh yes, of course. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, there are minerals. Well, Chris, for, for example, crystalline silicates. I mean, there are different kinds of uh, uh, minerals uh, uh, that which, which have been uh, detected spectroscopically. So, so both <laughs> both uh, crystalline uh, structures and above structures uh, are, are present. Now, with the, the the only thing is that above silicates are far more common. And then crystalline city case, for example. Okay, thank you. Okay, there are no more questions from the WebEx. I'll read out uh, questions from Hello, the YouTube ask? chat box. Hello, can I ask? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I have written my question in the chat box, but okay, let me ask directly. So, first of all, Professor Cock, thank you so much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I have just a couple of questions. So, first one is what conditions decide whether there will be or organics in ISM or in a star. And what are the conditions required for formation of more organics? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the spot. Okay, shall I okay. shall I explain the question? Okay, uh, Dr. Neeraj Rastogi, uh, he is asking the condition that, it, yes. that decides whether the ISM clouds have more organics or we have the stars that when it when it oh, okay. the star, so, then there will be more organics. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, thank you very much. So, so, for example, the UIE bands, you can see in the star formation regions, in H2 regions. So, so you can see them there. Now, the question is that when you take a spectrum of, say, the Orion Nebula, like you, you don't know how long the, the, these the carriers have been there, right? Because they could be there for 1 million years, 10 million years, or, or even longer. Now, the, the difference in a planetary nebula is that they only last 10,000 years. So we know that we see a UIE band in a planetary nebula they were made recently. And actually we can see them, you know, going through protoplanetary nebulae to planetary nebulae. We can see that they are being made uh, uh, in sequence over a short period of time. Now, so we don't know, I, we don't know for sure. You see the Orion Nebula, you also see organics there but you, we don't know whether these organics were made inside the Orion Nebula uh, during its lifetime, or it was imported from evolved star. So, so that, because the only evidence, direct evidence we have is that they're made by stars. So we are not ruling out any other possibilities. It's just that we have no evidence for it. 
no evidence that any organics are made in a molecular cloud or in in Orion Nebula, for example. If they, but they are there. Okay. My second question is. Yeah. So as you said that uh, there are organic compounds and they transition. So for example, acetylene is there, then it will, it can form uh, benzene and or then it can form BHS or other ring compounds. Right. And then further. So what are the stable compounds? Stable organic molecules in ISM. That is the first question. And the second one is based, based on the composition. So, for example, if I, we are looking at different ISM regions and we see the composition, say so some place there is more acetylene, less of the stable compound. And some place there is more stable compound, less acetylene. So, that means it is more evolved or fresh. Right, Can right. we do something with this composition? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So, so this is a complex question. So, you, you look at, uh, say, a torus, molecular cloud, or you look at Orion nebula. There were a variety of molecules which you can determine their relative abundances. Now, I'm sure there are chemical processes going on either through radiative interactions or other means. So, so the, the, the abundance of relative abundance of molecules may depend may be dependent on the environment. Okay. Now, so so this is uh, uh, there are people who do chemical models uh, who they think they may be able to explain that. Yeah, in 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 my talk here, I mostly concentrated on uh, complex organics. So I didn't talk talk about uh, simple organics. I mean, simple organics like methane or I mean, or, you know, five, ten carbon nectar molecules. So so those the abundance of those simple organics. Uh, they, they, the abundance can be measured. Uh, they, uh, the abundance could be changed due to the environment. But uh, so I, in in here, I more emphasize on the uh, the, the larger, uh, the more complex organics, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 try to convey the message that the only knowledge we have that may not be the only one, but that there's the only one we know are coming from stars. Okay. Thank you. So I'm not sure. out. The complex organics could be made in a solar system. No one know that. No one have any evidence for it. Okay. So the the uh, we do know that carbonaceous conjoint, which is the most primitive solar system object, the most likely to have interstellar origins. Okay. So that's the only it's kind of a circumstantial argument, but. But there is no, no one <laughs> has seen you know, that uh, or that that uh, complex organic could be made in the solar system. Maybe it, it was made 4.6 billion years ago. We don't know. We have no evidence for it. Okay. Thank you. I'll add on to that one uh, uh, simple question, but I, I hope it's a difficult one. Maybe how can we classify whether it's a simple or a complex molecule for the ISO? Classify. Uh, uh, how can we say that uh, it's a simple or a complex molecule? ISM. Is there a is there a definitive classification that? Oh no do? no, it's it's up to you. You can say you can say twenty carbon atom is simple. Yes. <laughs> you know, exactly. right? I mean, it's a, it's a relative term, but uh, yes. but but I mean, C sixty have sixty carbon atoms, so is it complex or simple? It's simple in structure, right? <laughs> but it has lots of carbon atoms, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but uh, but it, it, an irregular molecule may have only uh, two dozen carbon atoms. But if the the structure is complicated, then you may say, oh, it's a complex organic. <laughs> so it depends on what we mean, <laughs> right? It's it's not just size; it's it's also structure. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I'll read out uh, the questions from the YouTube chat box. Uh, the talk is attended uh, by. I have some questions. Arjit, yeah, Arjit, yeah, Arjit. Yeah. yeah, sir. So I have some questions to Professor Agbar. I'll thank you, sir, for your interesting talk. And I have a question regarding to the play to feature that you've shown in your talk the in fullerene containing interstellar object as well as UAE features. So is it, is it like that, that, uh, you know, very well known top down formation method of fullerene? They start from pH and then the hydrogen happen and then fullerene form. So is it common that the top-down formation from pH to fullerene leads to that kind of pay to feature observed 
both in fuller and containing plateau nebula at QI visits? I'm not sure I catch all the question. Uh, you talk about fullerene, right? Yeah, fullerene and the plateau features observed there. And uh, and it's relation to that pH to fullerene formation. Oh yes, so so people talk about uh, what where do fullerene come from? Okay, so yeah. so the idea in, in in my talk, I have a couple of slides talking about that all sources of fullerene have also the plateau features. Okay. So the yep. two properties are related. So the plateau features are also part of the UIE phenomenon. So, so these two, the UIE carrier, uh, properly have something to do with, with, uh, with fullerene. Now, so, so there are people who have different kinds of uh, scenarios being proposed, whether they could build up from simple things. So for example, we can build up by folding pH molecules, you can fold it into into fullerene, or there are people who talk about top-down scenarios. So you wake up a larger a complex organic like a moon, you can make a fullerene. So so these are there are there are different kinds of uh, scenarios are being presented by different authors. My second question is said that uh, that in the last couple of years, smaller pH like the benzonitrile or one cyanonaphthalene, this kind of small pH is detected. So do you think that these molecules are capable to rise up the UI features? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay, so in last couple of years, uh, the smaller yeah. pH like benzonitrile or one cyanonaphthalene or cyclopentadiene, this kind of small molecules detected in torus molecular cloud or dark matter or dark cloud. So do you know, think that this kind of molecule level to give rise UIE features. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, you, you are talking about the uh, uh, the, talk, the TM, TMC1. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Observations, yeah. Now, okay, so no pure pH molecules have been detected, but there are some uh, rings with nitrogen, for example, uh, have been detected. Now with the, uh, the new uh, techniques of uh, adding up spectra. So this is yeah. tremendous. I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, they did a fantastic job of uh, increasing the, uh, the building up the signal to noise. And uh, hopefully in the future, we are able to detect more hydrocarbons. So, so we, we have a better idea uh, whether uh, pH molecules are present uh, as free flying molecules. And if so, we can determine their abundance, right? But, but so far we haven't, <laughs> we haven't seen this a pure pH molecule. Except benzene. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arjun. McCoy, I mean, I, I think McCoy's group, they did a fantastic job. I mean, they, they detect a whole bunch of uh, more. As I mentioned before, the difficulty is in the uh, partition function. So they, their technique are really able to call, improve the, uh, the signal to noise of the, uh, of the uh, spectra. So, so so really uh, able to detect uh, much uh, uh, fainter sources. Thank you. We'll move on to the questions from uh, YouTube viewers. Uh, the talk was viewed by people from various disciplines. So I'll read out uh, one by one. Uh, there, there's a question from uh, Professor Vijay Sahu. Is it possible to study any subtle fundamental physics using the organic, the organic molecules of interstellar objects, which otherwise cannot be studied in the lab. And we use the molecules, organic molecules as tracers to understand uh, the fundamental physics. Is it possible? That's the question. Oh, well, okay. Now, the chemists have been studying the vibrational behavior of organics uh, since the 1960s. But once they under understood the principle, they don't care anymore, right? That's why no. Uh, that's why we are doing quantum chemistry calculations on these uh, complex moons because chemists uh, never bothered to do them, and now we have the uh, uh, computing capability to actually calculate the spectrum of uh, some of these uh, even 150, 200 carbon atom uh, molecule. Now, whether there is any fundamental physics coming out from it, I don't know. I I, uh, I I I won't be able to say because the chemists think 
all the fundamental things are understood. It's just a matter of complexity, right? So they think it's the same molecular dynamics. Is either atoms moving, stretching, or bending. So they don't think there are any new new fundamental things in there. But who knows? I mean, when you have a complex system, we are finding that there are more coupled modes. I mean, I didn't have time to show these examples, but but things get complicated. And uh, so, so it's not so easy for us to interpret a spectrum until we have a better understanding of the behavior of simple, intermediate, and larger carbonaceous molecules. So we have to do things one step at a time using modern techniques for quantum chemistry and computing power. I, I don't know whether I answered the question. There's another question. That's why, that's why the chemists, chemists, they don't care. They think they already know, so they don't care, right? I mean. Okay, so there's another question from Professor Bujia. What are the typical mechanisms by which organic molecules form in the interstellar objects? Oh, okay, so <laughs> I give a, a simple answer to that. We don't know <laughs> because theoretically, it is impossible to to form, say, molecules of three, four, five, ten, twenty atoms or minerals under circumstellar conditions because the density of a stellar wind or in a planetary nebulae, uh, the density is lower than the best vacuum you can create in the lab. Okay, so theoretically it is impossible, but observationally we see the minerals forming. We can see the silicate dust forming. So we know that from a sequence of several hundred years from one HEV star to another, we see different molecules uh, from HCN to HC3N to HC5N, we see them forming. So somehow nature is forming these molecules and solids, I think under thermodynamical non-equilibrium means. And most of our chemistry knowledge are based on thermodynamical equilibrium, abundance of equilibrium conditions. So we don't really know enough <laughs> about, <laughs> about the, the, these kind of unusual conditions and how chemistry could proceed, other than the fact that they do happen. I mean, that's the most important point. They happen in spite of the fact that we don't know how. There's another question from uh, Professor Bujia. Are there any diatomic molecules observed in the interstellar objects? Any... Are there any diatomic molecules? Yes. Observed in the ISM? There are many diatomic molecules. There are many yeah. diatomic molecules, yeah. H2, for example, right? I mean, CO, <laughs> is that what you mean? Yeah. So there, yeah. So there, there are many. There are many. Yeah. CS, CP. Yeah. But there was a difficulty in observing oxygen, right? For a long time, it was found only in two thousand seven. So the oxygen was found in. Uh, yeah. 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 Both in oxygen systems and carbon rich systems, different kinds of molecules, but they all. They are all able to form. Yeah, so 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 McGuire, in the recent catalog of McGuire, he has uh, over 200 some molecules listed. Uh, you can look at his paper and see the whole uh, current catalog of uh, uh, molecules detected both in ISM and also in stars. Okay, thank you. And then there's a question by Professor Sachindra Nayak. During the stellar evolution, mass is ejected in the form of stellar wind. A right. surface material, mainly hydrogen, is being ejected. How do the molecules like SiO, SIS, right, etc., observed in the spectrum? Oh, they they all ejected, you know, in the the uh, the, 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 the 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 stellar atmosphere is like the sun <laughs> has a mixture of different elements in in some ratio. So in the in the ejector, you have uh, well. Hydrogen definitely, but depending on the, do you have more carbon or more oxygen? You have more carbon, 
that all the oxygens are tied up in CO, and the, the leftover carbon are used to form C2, C3, CN, and so on. If you are oxygen rich, then all the carbon are tied up in CO, then your oxygens are left over to form OH, H2O, SiO. So, so that's the, the only difference. Okay, thank you. Then uh, there's a question by Professor uh, Harish Kadavi. How do large organic molecules present in the meteorites survive on entry in the atmosphere? Oh, wow. Well, you can pick up with your hand. <laughs> so the meteorite, they probably burn up 90% of the, the mass uh, when it went through the atmosphere, but still some stuff left, right? I mean, they, they have, the fact that we can pick up a meteorite, meaning that, that not everything is burned up. <laughs> so we, that the, I, I, say, I always say that the meteorites are the, the greatest gift by heaven, right? Because uh, uh, from uh, we can pick up from the ground a piece of heaven that otherwise we have to a lot of toil to fly into space with spacecraft uh, to pick it up. And here at meteorites, where uh, God give us a piece of rock, we can uh, take home and uh, put in the lab and, uh, and analyze, right? I mean, so this is a really a great, great opportunity. And that's why in the 1970s that uh, uh, that uh, when all these organics were discovered, uh, you know, it was a uh, it was a great uh, uh, surprise because uh, because at that time people didn't think that the organics were so common. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So so I should go back and also say that most of the organics are in a special kind of meteorite, they are carbonaceous chondrites, okay? So not every meteorite <laughs> have organics, but but the carbonaceous chondrites, they are most primitive kind of meteorite. They probably come from uh, the early solar system 4.6 billion years ago, and, and those have the most organics. Thank you. Then there is a question by uh, from uh, Professor Deepankar Banerjee. Infrared space observatory found an ice feature at 6.82 microns in several young stellar objects, which was loosely classified as being due to organics. He citing Gibbettel. Has the carrier of this molecule been identified? Uh, 6. 6.82 micron. I am sorry. I don't know. I don't know about there. Are, there are lots of identified things there. You know, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, in a, in, a, in a typical spectrum, any spectrum, you go to the millimeter, uh, maybe 20% of the features are unidentified, okay? So there are lots of, there are, there are lots of molecules that we know are present in abundance, but we don't know what they are. So that the fraction of unidentified molecules is really very interesting. So, so the astronomer put a U in it, I mean, meaning un unidentified. I mean, in spite of the fact we identify a lot, but still there are lots of things we don't know. Okay, thank you. There is a question by uh, Dr. Ankan Das. Could you please comment on the fate of identifying noble gas related species in planetary nebula with, this, with the JWST? Uh, what species? Noble gas related species, such as that, uh, uh, say, for example, largon hydride, AR H plus, neon hydride, any H plus. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, HS, JWST can do uh, a lot of things. I mean, there, there are, I mean, common, common molecular ions or radicals, and that uh, maybe the abundance are uh, not so high, but uh, with uh, good sensitivity, we can detect a lot of new things. Yeah, sure. I'm sure. Okay, thank you. And there is a message from Professor Deepankar Banerjee uh, that uh, congratulations, Professor Kwok, on more than 40 plus years of your revolutionary paper on interacting winds model on planetary nebula formation. Okay, and then there's a question uh, by uh, uh, Prachi. What kind of models or assumptions are used for getting the abundances of various molecules in planetary nebulae or ISM, etc.? Oh, okay. So, so that's why, I mean, 
most of the time the detection are in emission, right? So emission is not so easy because it depends on the oxidator strength of the uh, of the transition, and we also have the question of excitation. So you have to decide the molecule is excited by collisionally or radiatively, then you have to have an excitation model before you can derive an abundance. So it's some uncertainty in the, um, some model dependent when you derive an abundance. Now in absorption, it's much easier. Absorption, there's no excitation involved. So when you see an absorption feature, you can de directly derive the column density because so long you know the oxidator strength. So, so, so that's why uh, when I talk about this, the 3.4 micron feature, so the abundance of this aliphatic compound is much better determined than the, de the, the abundance we can derive from emission features. So we have much more confidence in the abundance based on that absorption feature than, than from emission features. And it is very perplexing because the number derived is 15% of the carbon is in the form of adiphatic. And that's based on looking at our own galaxy in external galaxies. And 15% is a lot. Okay? So because carbon can be in many forms. And if you 15% is in adiphatics, there's a lot of adiphatics. Thank you. Right, so there are no more questions. Uh, so we'll uh, pass it on to our uh, Dr. Manas. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Before we move to this uh, concluding section, I have just one question I just want to ask. Uh, Professor Kwok, we see a lot of pH molecules in the H2 region environment, right? And you made a nice comparison between pH molecules and the molecules you found called M MAON, right? right? So, yeah. So, do you also expect to see the uh, abundance of a a a M MAON molecule in H2 regions environment? Well, the, the, everything we see are the UIE bands. It's just the interpretation is different, okay? So, people, some people believe in the pH hypothesis. They think the UIE bands are due to pH. I don't think so. I mean, I think they are due to more complex amorphous hydrocarbons, okay, called moons, right? So, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not saying that I told no pH molecules in the universe, but they are not responsible for the UIE bands that we are seeing, seeing spectroscopically throughout the universe. Okay, okay thank so you. In spite of the fact, in spite of the fact, the pH hypothesis is extremely popular, okay? Okay? A lot of people believe in it. But I, what I'm trying to write in my paper is that there are lots of problems with this hypothesis, as I try to point out in this talk. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kwak. <coughs> now I will invite uh, my colleague, uh, Vinit Goswami, to you know, conclude the session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Manish Samal. Uh, that brings us to the conclusion of the 23rd episode of the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Sun Kowak for accepting our invitation and giving an excellent talk in PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. Also, we are thankful to Professor Kowak for answering the audience's questions after the talk. Uh, second, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our audiences on both the YouTube and WebEx platforms. Next, I express my sincere thanks to PRL Director, Professor Anil Bhardwaj, Dean PRL, Professor D. Pallam Raju, and Chair Professor Nandita Srivastava, and Co-Chair Professor Lokesh Sahu of the PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan Committee for all their support in organizing this Vyakhyan successfully. I also thank my colleagues in the Vyakhyan Organizing Committee for successfully conducting the 23rd episode of PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan series. I sincerely thank you all for being part of the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and PRL at 75 celebration. Kindly visit our website and other media platforms to know more about the upcoming events being held at PRL, in particular PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan. Uh, the next two episodes of PRL Ka Amrit Vyakhyan are going to be held at, the, at today's starting time, 
So do join us uh, for the upcoming two episodes of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan at 10 a.m. Indian Standard Time. With these words, I propose for closer of today's episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. Thank you very much.